we could, of course, have a, 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 a whole range of different uh, presentations on the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have time, so um, I have to be selective. So our final one is the question of discerning the work of the Holy Spirit and what to look for and what also to avoid. I think we've already um, pointed out that the Spirit's main work is to focus upon Christ. Calvin wrote that the principal work of faith is the principal work of the Holy Spirit. And for Calvin, and also the Bible, of course, faith is directed preeminently to Christ. It's to God, to God's promise uh, in the Gospel, but that promise is focused upon his incarnate Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ, as Calvin put it, clothed with the Gospel. Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, in, in the Upper Room Discourse, in chapters 13 to 17, and particularly in 14 and 16, uh, points out that the Spirit will not speak on his, of, his, of himself or on his own behalf, but will, uh, he says, uh, speak of me, uh, of Christ himself. Uh, in, uh, let's read that in John 14, verse 26, for, for instance, uh, to make this uh, clear. In this speech, Jesus is looking forward and anticipating Pentecost and what follows. And he says, but the helper, is the paraclete, sometimes described as comforter, but it means it's not a very good translation. It means more like an advocate. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Um, and then in chapter 16, verses 12 to 15, it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. You note again the inseparability of the, the, of the, of the Trinity, indivisibility. He, he, the Spirit, glorifies the Son. He takes what the Father has and declares it to you. So what the Father has refers to the Son and the Spirit in turn uh, declares those things to us. And earlier in that speech, back in chapter 14, he says, I, I will, in verse 18, um, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Let a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, and he's talking about um, back in uh, verse 17, coming of the Spirit of Truth. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Again, the Trinitarian focus, uh, the Son and the Father mutually indwelling, made known by the Spirit as well. So the Spirit gives us assurance uh, of, our, um, of, of Christ. All the works of the Trinity, all three persons integrally involved. The Holy Spirit there is seen as the author of the apostolic teaching. Teaching of the apostles, as we've just read, is tantamount to the teaching of Christ himself. He had many things to say. He wasn't able to say them, not because he lacked the ability, 
but because the disciples were rather obtuse and uh, stubborn. But when the Spirit came, he would make those things known, uh, and through the apostles, of course. So when Paul and Peter and John write, they write with the authority of Christ, and they do so because of the Spirit and the anointing which he had given them. There was a, 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 a kind of figure in, in Israel, the Shaliach, who was a kind of emissary of, um, of, a, digni of a dignitary. Uh, a, a leading figure might send somebody as their kind of representative. And the Talmud states that um, uh, the Shaliach is as the sender. And it's that kind of idea that the apostles are the, the ambassadors, the emissaries, the representatives of Christ, who, in fact, are endowed with his authority for their task in being the foundation of the church. And, of course, it's the Holy Spirit who empowers them for that task. So, I think we may conclude that the Holy Spirit is most powerfully at work where Christ is the center of, fo of the focus. Because Christ is the Savior. Paul, beginning of the letter to the Romans, describes himself as separated to the gospel of God concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that really designates the whole subsequent content of Paul's letter to the Romans that the gospel is Jesus Christ our Lord, the good news. Because the central promise of God's covenant in the old covenant was, I will be your God, you shall be my people. Now, how is God, the holy, almighty, and just God, our God? He is our God in Jesus Christ, his Son. And how are we his people? We're his people because we're united to Jesus Christ, the Son. The whole of God's covenant is focused upon Jesus Christ. Um, that was the, 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 the end to which Peter's sermon on Act 2 was directed. That was the central focus of the Holy Spirit at that time, in empowering the apostle there in the book of Acts, chapter 2. It drove him, impelled him on to declare the uh, person of Jesus Christ and his work. And so Paul can say in Romans 10 about his compatriots, the Jews, how shall they call upon him whom they have not heard? And the, the language there in tales the fact that in the preaching of the gospel, Christ himself is heard. He speaks. His voice is heard through the proclamation of the gospel message. Now, I mentioned about the sacraments earlier, and I, I, I mentioned it again simply because in conservative Protestant circles, uh, the sacraments have been, I would go so far as to say, scandalously undervalued, probably in the last 100 or 150 years. So much so that the Lord's Supper in many churches is regarded as uh, almost an optional extra. Indeed, I'm a minister of a Presbyterian denomination, and my sec uh, in my second church, which will be nameless, a wonderful church, I must say, but when I first came there, the Lord's Supper was held just six times in the year. Six times a year. Uh, it's now held uh, 52 times in the year, but it was, origin it was six. So that gives you a sense that even in a denomination which has a a focus on the word and sacraments, there was that lack. And I, I refer to Ian Murray and Martin Lloyd-Jones, two pillars of conservative Protestantism and reformed thinking and preaching over the last 
last getting on for a century and uh, disregarding it. Now, the sacraments, I would suggest, are totally, totally centred on Christ. In baptism, we are uh, baptised in union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Baptism displays the cleansing from sin by the washing of water through Jesus Christ. Get up, Paul, Ananias said to him, and be baptized and wash away your sins. It portrays vividly before our very eyes the gospel. It portrays Christ and his work in his death and resurrection and in his cleansing of us from sin in a way which is different than the preaching of the word. The preaching applies to the ears and the understanding, the sacraments to the eyes, and perhaps more, you might say, more mystically, more, uh, more, more intuitively and subjectively, perhaps, by their visual representation. Paul can say in Romans 6, in reply to the question, since the grace of God is so great, shall we continue to sin? that grace may abound. God forbid, don't you know you were baptized into Christ? And if you were, you were baptized into his death and his resurrection. And as for the Lord's Supper, I refer again to the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is the most comprehensive of all uh, Reformation and post-Reformation confessions, and is typical across the board it talks about in the Lord's Supper, faithful receivers receive and feed on Christ crucified. His body broken with the breaking of bread and his blood poured out. Nothing could be more graphically illustrate the reality to which the sacraments point. It is to Christ himself. Uh, the bread which we break, is it not a koinonia participation in the body of Christ? The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a koinonia fellowship participation in the blood of Christ? And even more in John chapter 6, Jesus describes himself as the bread of life which had greater power and efficacy than the manna in Israel, in the, in the desert. He said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. It is, as I suggested, a, a scandal of immense proportions that those elements which are, in which Christ is presented for us, as Augustine put it, as a kind of visible word of God, were reduced to a sideline. It's no wonder, no wonder that the church generally has lost its grip upon society when it has lost its grip upon the gospel which it proclaims and those ways and means by which that gospel is presented vividly before people. And it's something which really is, needs to be put right. And it's not surprising, you have Jeff Thomas next uh, month, um, who uh, you know, is a minister for over 50 years, graduate of Westminster Seminary, Wales, um, on revival. Many of these revivals happened in connection with the Lord's Supper. And it's not surprising. So, the Spirit focuses upon Jesus Christ. And that, I think, is the yardstick by which we can measure the extent to which the Spirit is, rep is represented, you might say, or the focus of the Spirit is being followed, maybe a better way to describe it, uh, by the church. The second element is transformation into Christ, which is another theme which has been neglected in the Latin church. When I say Latin church, 
I'm referring to the Protestants and Rome. It's interesting, you know, I've, uh, force of circumstances and interests uh, led me over the years to uh, familiarize us with Greek, um, the Greek fathers, and we had contact with Orthodox as well. They've written a few things about it. But anyway, the, as uh, the, the well-known um, Englishman, Timothy Ware, who became, he was an Anglican who became Orthodox and became a bishop, Bishop Callistos Ware, wrote, in the West, in Catholics and Protestants, the same questions are addressed, but they provide different answers. Now, questions relating to the atonement and justification, although justification isn't such a big thing with Rome as it is with Protestantism, it's the same kind of question. In the Greek, Russian, the Orthodox churches, it's not the answers which are different, it's the questions are different. And there there has been, I think, a focus which, on which we can learn appropriately and which have been present in, in, amongst Calvin, amongst the Puritans, for example, but have been, to a great extent, lost. Paul writes, for example, um, when he speaks about the veil which lies upon the minds of his compa Jewish compatriots and the God of this world blinding the minds of unbelievers, that we, however, with unveiled face, behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, are being transformed from one degree of glory to another by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit who has regenerated us is in the process of transforming us throughout our lives until such time as we are fully conformed to the image of the Son, as Paul puts it in Romans 8. John, I alluded to this yesterday, uh, in 1 John 3, says, what, see what love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Uh, our status is not recognized by the world around. And in fact, it persecuted Jesus it crucified him. Don't be surprised if it does persecute us as well. Not yet, it's not evident to the world. And what we are, John goes on to say, is not yet evident to us. But we know that when he appears, when Christ appears, we shall be like him in glory for we shall see him as he is. We'll see the glorified Christ in a way similar to what the appearance to Paul on the road to Damascus, or to John on the Isle of Patmos, but in this case, unaffected by the element of sin which still was present in both Paul and John, at that time, we will be cleared from all sin and be able to perceive realities which currently our own condition inhibits us from doing. We shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. And that should transform our attitude to the final judgment because that final judgment is, of course, in one sense, a most terrifying reality. But it's one in which those who are believers will already, already be glorified. Because when Jesus returns, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. 
And so consequently, it's nothing to be afraid of for the Christian. Nothing whatsoever. Because we will, under Christ and with him, participate in it. Don't you know, Paul says, we shall judge the world. Aren't you aware we shall judge angels? How much more things of this life? So there's transformation. Uh, the foretaste of which, of course, as we referred yesterday, is in the transfiguration. Uh, Jesus, the incarnate Christ, was transformed before the eyes of Peter, James, and John. Um, so, the Spirit focuses upon Christ and is in the process of transforming us into his image. Uh, a view which the Eastern Church uh, understood in one coherent, integrated reality, whereas we in the West tend to chop it in analytically into little segments rather than seeing the whole picture. I think both those sides are important to grasp. This, the the, the small-scale analytical things are vital, but so is the big picture as well. You need two lungs rather than one, in other words, to uh, uh, breathe that kind of air. Now, uh, hearkening back to the orthodox, um, we, uh, uh, we're not familiar so much with their art and so forth, which is not art it's, it's more, their art is, is actually part of their worship. But the saints are depicted with solid golden halos around their heads to denote the fact that they are in the process of being transformed. And I've often thought that if we regarded each other as having a solid golden halo around our head, it might make a bit of difference to the way in which we might treat people. Uh, they're being transformed and so also are we. So, the Spirit focuses on Christ and transforms us into Christ and produces fruit. Paul describes that, of course, in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Uh, these sound very unspectacular. Uh, kindness, patience, and so on. It's all related to serving others. In fact, people say, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what gifts the Spirit has given me. Well, the gifts the Spirit has given you will be well demonstrated as you seek opportunities to be of help, encouragement, and support to other people. Because the Spirit is love. God is love. And the fruit of the Spirit preeminently is love. Love will not pass away. Other gifts might and perhaps do, but love never fails and never passes away because that is who God is. And as Paul said, when, when he was facing trial in his first imprisonment, and he wrote in Philippians, uh, and he wasn't absolutely sure of the outcome, whether he would be executed or whether he would be released. He said, if I, to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, uh, because, he says, I will be with the Lord. But it is better that I remain uh, to be with you, for that will be fruit of work. In other words, it'd be, Paul concluded, it'd be better for him to remain, even though it might not be to his highest advantage, because in remaining, he would be able to continue to serve the church and its members. In other words, love for other people transcends personal advantage. And that indeed is the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus says that on the day of judgment, we'll be judged according to the way in which we deal 
with the very least of his people. Um, the very least. That's the yardstick. That's the test. Um, I remember in one church um, there was a, a, a CEO came into the congregation who was uh, CEO of a company which insured um, virtually every um, nuclear power station in the United States and beyond. And uh, some people made a beeline to take this chap out for, for lunch. Obviously, I hope he stays at the church. Um, you know, the advantages may accrue there. There was another man, however, who sat in a chair and occasionally urinated in the chair because of medical problems which he'd had, partly self-induced. Uh, the question is, what is the yardstick for judgment on the final day? How you treat the CEO of the big corporation. And some congregations, of course, are basically corporate America at prayer. Or how you treat the man who sits and urinates in the chair. It's the latter according to Jesus. So the fruit of the Spirit, how do you tell whether the fruit of the Spirit is operative? Where, 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 where we, a church, the church generally, is acting in accordance with the fruit. It's how they treat the least and the lowest. Love, gentleness, patience, kindness, self-control. A world of difference. The world around us places a, pro a premium on dynamism, achievement, setting of policies and goals, and so on and so forth, all of which have their place, of course. But it's rather different standards which uh, are operative there. A word or two about the claims of charismatic movement. Um, you're aware that... Um, Pentecostalism emerged uh, back around 1900 uh, in San Francisco and spread rapidly. So you have a, a number of, uh, in this country, uh, Pentecostal denominations, initially focused upon the idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit as a post-conversion experience and so on. From the 1960s, there was what is generally known as ca the charismatic renewal which sprang up initially in Episcopal churches, but spread right the way across denominations and remained largely within those denominations, um, advocating that the extraordinary gifts of the uh, New Testament were re restored to the church in our own time. And then we had the third wave coming in the 70s and 80s, uh, with stress on signs and wonders, uh, largely associated with house churches. You've probably heard of the vineyard uh, churches and so forth. All of which has had a big effect upon the hymnology or chorusology of, um, of, of Western um, conservative Protestantism, uh, focusing very, very much on glory, and other such analogous things, but not on the whole counsel of God so much, which is in, in itself a disturbing uh, phenomenon. The, uh, the, the Pentecostal, for the want of a better word, movement embracing all these three is pervasive, of course, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and it's estimated there are over one billion uh, Pentecostals. I'm not sure how many are members of the Association for Confessing Evangelicals, but there's over one billion. And in, this is regarded really as the future of Christianity. Uh, it's a vast and amorphous movement covering a huge spectrum. There's 
You, if, you, if you want to know what a Presbyterian believes, you or ought to believe, you go to the Westminster Confession. If you want to know what Anglicans ought to believe, some denominations do, but others, like Church of England, uh, don't so much. The 39 Articles, perhaps, and so on. But there's no such documents for the, uh, uh, for the charismatic um, movement as a whole. Uh, it covers a spectrum from those who believe in a reformed doctrine of salvation. Uh, we have quite a few students from that background in, in the UK. Uh, right across to prosperity gospel and virtually all shades in between, including Roman Catholics and Orthodox and, and so forth. And as many of the leading spokesmen say, the movement is not Protestant, nor Western, uh, nor Catholic, a movement of itself which has no uniform government, no uniform belief, but rather is united in its determination to, as one leading uh, author puts it, to s keep the flame burning. Well, the f identity of the flame is, of course, uh, up for uh, discussion. So there's no single distinctive body of doctrine or church polity. It may take various forms and sometimes, in some circles, is, is uh, not really distinguishable from um, non-charismatic uh, per uh, persons. So it's, very, it's impossible to make widespread generalizations, except to say that the absence of clear doctrine as a foundation is a major problem. It, it identifies the movement as such, bearing in mind there's many exceptions, with a form of mysticism rather than anything else, being based upon an experience rather than on doctrine. As to the claim that extraordinary gifts of the New Testament have been restored, in my book I point to the fact that there's no coherent understanding by New Testament scholars or theologians about what those gifts in the New Testament actually were. For example, the tongues, the only clear identification we have in the Bible for what tongues were, were speaking in foreign languages, uh, unknown to the speaker. In 1 Corinthians, some have argued that uh, what Paul is referring to there is ecstatic speech, but it can equally be understood for the same phenomena as occur in uh, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 8. And it is noteworthy that it's only really in the, in the writings of Paul and Luke, uh, and Luke was part of Paul's own travelling group, that we read of that. It was not present in any of the any indication in the writings of John or Peter or elsewhere. So uh, and those gifts were, were by no means regarded as pervasive amongst the New Testament churches. Gordon Fee, who was a, uh, a fuller theological seminary and a Pentecostal, argued that there's no way of knowing and recovering what those gifts actually were, and indeed, it's pointless even to ask. So I think one has to suggest that the claims that such gifts have been restored cannot be established if we don't know what they were in the first place. Which is not necessarily to uh, condemn them right across the board. I think we have to be careful about that. There have, however, as often is the case in such movements, been instances which are more troubling. And these actually are quite widespread in some circles. You, some of you of a certain age will recall about 30 years ago, there were some unusual occurrences in Toronto, and people flocked from all over the world to uh, see and observe what was happening. Um, there were people who were barking like dogs and there was uncontrollable laughter going on, laughing in the spirit uh, 
a whole group laughing for extended periods of time, slaying in the spirit, uh, where people were, uh, fell backwards and suddenly had all their problems which were besetting them were somehow miraculously overcome. John Stott made some very acute and incisive observations of this. Um, he argued that such phenomena were to be rejected on a number of grounds. Firstly, anti-intellectualism. It was the idea that you close your mind off and uh, just be, therefore, open to the Holy Spirit. Stott pointed out that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And in fact, that Paul, for example, expected his readers to think very, very hard and carefully, so much so that Peter said that in his writings there's a lot of things which are difficult to understand. Uncontrollable laughter, Stott argued, runs right against this, the biblical uh, teaching that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Uh, it's clear that even Paul, when he, on the road to Damascus, had faced with the experience of the risen Christ and was blinded temporarily and struck down, he replied rationally, Who are you, Lord? he said. And John, in his great visions of the glorified Christ, he, the strength is, laid out, is, is taken out of him, but he records exactly what was, said, what was said and done. They were both in possession of their faculties. Barking like dogs, Stott said, and hyenas, is right opposed to the bi clear biblical teaching in which human beings are in authority over the animals and are not encouraged to act like them. These phenomena, incidentally, happened in some of the revival movements in uh, the 18th century as well. And finally, slaying in the spirit. If you note, and Stodd observed this well, that when people are confronted by an appearance of God or an angel, they fall f flat on their face, never backwards. Um, what, I think one has a justification in inferring that since the Holy Spirit is the author and giver of life, he will effect such a fall in a manner which is most likely to preserve and maintain life rather than one which endangers it, as falling backwards can very easily do. Moreover, of course, it's interesting that in most of those cases, there is actually somebody standing behind the person, ready to catch them, as if there is a prearrangement. Now, people, as I say, flock to see such phenomena, thinking that the spirit produces events such as that, how many will flock to see a group of Christians who are self-controlled or patient? Uh, we're going to visit a, a church uh, over in Asia in a couple of weeks, it might be said, uh, because they are very patient and kind. I don't think you'd find such uh, a traffic going on. So in other words, we have to be very careful about claims such as those and measure them against what the Holy Spirit himself reveals in Scripture. All Scriptures breathed out by God as men were carried along by the Spirit and men wrote from God. As they were swept along by the Spirit, Peter says in 2 Peter 1, men wrote they were writing in accordance with their own personality, their own character, in full possession of their faculties, so that when Paul wrote Romans, he was writing as Paul did, as God had prepared him for that very purpose to do. And Peter wrote in a different way, and as Isaiah and Micah write in different ways, in different uh, 
uh, according to the personality God gave them. There's a, a concursive work of the Holy Spirit uh, and the human author in each of those cases. And that's a paradigm for the work of the Spirit amongst us. He works in accordance with the personalities he has given to us. With some, it may be more, you might say, ecstatic, and others less so, and more uh, intellectual. But it's in accordance with what God has given to us. Um, we are made in his image. We're great by God's grace, his partners and co-workers, and he respects that. And finally, the Holy Spirit, as we've said, has spoken in Scripture, and he does speak today. The author of Hebrews, when he quotes the Psalms in chapter 3, says, as the Holy Spirit says, present tense, Spirit spoke when Psalm 95, which he's quoting there in Hebrews 3, 7, he spoke when that was originally penned. But he speaks today whenever it is read, whenever it is proclaimed. He continues to speak because he is the living God who transcends time and space. So the scripture is a living and active word of God. Uh, and consequently, as Paul says, beneficial for, uh, for, for everything we need. Well, that's, that's it uh, for what I'm going to say. Um,